I would like to talk about um, a problem of uh, what we describe as relaxation, relaxation under topological constraints. And that sounds rather complex, but really it's quite simple. Uh, for example, I'm relaxed in this uh, armchair now, but subject to the topological constraints of my internal construction, which won't allow me to relax any further. We think of this very much in the context of magnetic fields, where it's very important, this idea. If you take a magnetic field and think of the magnetic lines of force, wandering in a rather, what may be a chaotic manner, in a highly conducting fluid medium or plasma, then you can ask the question, given such a structure, suppose we allow it to relax, that is to lose energy, but subject to the constraint of its topology. In other words, if there are knots or links in that magnetic field, then these must survive. Then the question is, what is the minimum energy state? This is what we describe as magnetic relaxation, subject to the topological constraint. And there's a great deal of interest in this. It's very important, for example, in the context of uh, thermonuclear fusion devices, where you want to contain a plasma, a hot ionized gas, by a magnetic blanket, as it's described, to keep it away from the uh, solid container, which would just uh, evaporate under the very high temperatures involved. So the magnetic, the idea of magnetic blanket has been around for a long time, but you need to have stable conditions, a stable configuration, and it can't be too simple, we know that. And so this problem is rather central in this context. Now, uh, just a, a few years ago, uh, in discussion with one of my former students, Lorenzo Rica. We um, were thinking about the opposite problem, where you take um, a loop of magnetic field, and this is what is uh, an element of dynamo theory. You imagine that you stretch it like an elastic band to twice the radius, and then you twist it and fold it back on itself. So you have then the loop going around twice. You have doubled the magnetic field intensity by this process, and then you can imagine doing it again and again. This is an iterated problem, and in that way you double the magnetic field intensity every time. But it's a little more complex than that, because if it is actually a tube that you stretch and fold, then a twist appears in the tube during the folding process. So one has to try to understand this, uh, what is going on. Now, if you take the wire, stretch and twist once and back to itself, then the boundary nearly is actually the boundary of what we describe as a Möbius strip. And uh, if you take a wire in this form and dip it into a soap solution, and pull it out of the soap solution, and make sure it, you puncture the large hole, you're left with a soap film in the form of a Mobius strip. And that's a rather interesting concept, a one-sided soap film. This experiment was carried out actually way back by the, uh, the mathematician Richard Courant uh, in around 1940. But we repeated, we decided to repeat the experiment. So we formed this Mobius strip and then we took the boundary and gradually opened it out again and untwisted it back to the form of a circle. Now you ask what happens to the one-sided soap film when the boundary moves back towards a circle? And uh, the answer is that at a certain instant, suddenly, at one moment it's one side, the next moment it's two-sided. And it happens very suddenly, in a matter of milliseconds. It's hard to, to follow with the eye. So then we roped in uh, my good colleague Raymond Goldstein and uh, Adriana Pesky in my department in Cambridge, who do very good experiments with high-speed camera. And uh, we followed this with a high-speed camera, which resolved the nature of the jump. And what happens is, when the jump occurs, it, the, the hole through the original Möbius strip contracts to a point, it contracts very rapidly, to a point on, on the boundary 
on the wire. So we were able, by using the high-speed photography, to follow exactly the progress of this transition and how it occurs. In other words, how a one-sided surface can jump to a two-sided surface. Now, in both cases, the surface of a soap film is a minimal area surface. So it is relaxed. The area is proportional to the energy. And that's why it relates to the magnetic field problem. You have a, uh, a soap surface, which is minimal energy. You gradually change the boundary condition. It always remains minimal area. But at a certain critical point, it can no longer sustain this without making a sudden jump. Uh, the analogy in the magnetic field context is interesting. You have magnetic field, for example, out of the surface of the sun. The magnetic field emerges from the surface in large loops that extend into the solar corona. And the foot points move around in a continuous manner because of the subsurface turbulence. So the field in the corona has to adjust continuously, slowly, like the soap film, it has to adjust to the movement of the foot points. And at certain critical points, discontinuities appear in the magnetic field. And that it causes an immediate jump to a new topological configuration. And these jumps in the solar chromosphere, um, well, corona, um, occur when you get a, a discontinuity, that is to say, a current sheet where a large, high level of uh, heating occurs due to ohmic dissipation. And this is one of the explanations for the extremely high temperature of the solar corona. So this is one important application for this uh, sort of theory. So we have an analogy there between the behavior of a soap film when you gradually move the boundary and the behavior of magnetic fields for example, in the solar corona, when you gradually change the boundary condition on the surface of the sun. So this is what we're studying. And uh, we are continuing this study with uh, different shapes of wire, different knotted configurations. And we try to classify the nature of the topological jumps that can occur for a soap film. This is, it seems like a game, children playing with soap bubbles. And it is, it's great fun in the laboratory, but it has this underlying important motivation to understand the jumps that can occur in uh, fields like magnetic fields. They also occur in vorticity fields in turbulence, and that's a large story. Well, I'd just like to mention one uh, problem that is a matter of some controversy in my view. There is a theory going back to J.B. Taylor in 1974, approximately. Uh, Taylor considered the problem of magnetic relaxation. And he considered that uh, the helicity, the magnetic helicity, the helicity of the magnetic field was one conserved quantity. So he minimized the energy subject to the one single constraint of conservation of helicity, the global helicity. And he was concerned with uh, the tokamak, the thermonuclear fusion problem in uh, geometries like a torus, like the tokamak. And uh, his theory was uh, is very widely accepted. But um, uh, there was always a, a slight problem with the theory in that um, there's a whole family of helicity invariants, in fact, not just one of the whole. But when you have a geometry that is axisymmetric, as in a torus, then you have a full, whole family of helicity invariants. And to select one, the global helicity, and suppose it is invariant, but neglect all the other invariants, is a little bit worrying. So um, this is one reason for studying very closely the, the question of what happens when magnetic flux tubes reconnect due to some diffusive process. And that, again, is something that uh, we're working on, is attracting a lot of attention. My own belief is that the magnetic, uh, the helicity is destroyed during each of these magnetic reconnections. But as I say, this problem is controversial. There are different views on it. And uh, this is very much dependent on, uh, on the computation 
and experiment and theory. All these three ingredients have to interact and come to the same conclusion in the end.